Clearly, it's such a lovely sunny evening that we've got quite a lot of light. You all right? Yes. Good. Excellent. Um, just a couple of things to tell you before Neil starts his talk. Um, you've got one more week to view the current open exhibition. Uh, it closes next Saturday the 10th. Um, and then our, what we call the hanging team, I'm not quite sure whether that's a good... <laughs> Anyway, they get to work, they take it all down, and they put the next one on up. And the one after, uh, starting on the 17th of June, is called Pirates, Fact and Fiction. Um, so there's something for historians and something for children and something for everybody in between. Uh, we're having a grand opening on the 17th of June, and uh, it'll be free entry to the Museum and Art Gallery. And um, there'll be family pirate crafts going on, um, costumes encouraged. So those of you who are wearing blue and white stripes tonight, you're well in. Um, and um, our next talk on the first Friday of July, which I think is the 7th, um, is uh, Ian Friel, Dr Ian Friel, who is a maritime historian. And um, he's had a very long uh, career in museums and uh, has now become a writer and consultant. He's written many books, but he's going to come and talk to us about piracy. And uh, he's going to the history of piracy. Um, how R.L. Stevenson, Robert Louis Stevenson, um, got to his book about pirates. And then he's going to talk about what happened. He's going to talk about to the pirates report here. Uh, who knows? I think uh, it wasn't a very happy end. Um, so that's what's on. And then we have a break from our talks for um, August, and then we start again in September. Um, <laughs> one you made earlier. I haven't spat on it, really. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay, well, tonight's speaker is Neil McLaughlin. Um, he's a local man, lives in Sway. And Ian has been writing books about the English Civil War on his commute to London. He's had a, um, quite a career in business and real estate consulting. And um, living in Sway and commuting to London, he thought a very good thing to do with his time was to revisit the area where you were brought up. I was brought up at Cor around Corfe Castle as well. So um, it's a great place, and the Banks family have a terrific history, and you've drawn some parallels between that and nations in ruins, shall we say. Uh, no comment about where we are now and going in full circle, but never mind. Um, so, A Nation in Ruins is Neil's first book in a trilogy. Um, he's got some here. If you are interested in what he's saying, um, you can buy one at the end. He very kindly lent me a copy, and I have to say I really enjoyed it. So, there we go. Um, and I learned an awful lot about the banks and the Civil War that I didn't know. So, thank you. And thank you for coming to talk to us. So with that, I will hand over to Neil, and as usual, we'll have some questions at the end. Thank you, Prue. Can you all hear me? Just checking on the microphone. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I, lots of people do say a nation of ruins. That's a, that's a story about today's, uh, today's uh, Britain. But in fact, it's, uh, it's all about the English Civil War. Um, and um, yeah, it's great to be here and just to talk about uh, talk about the book and, and, and my research related to it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, first, I'm going to start with the um, oh, uh, it's the fir first book in a trilogy actually. The second one's just about to come out. So this one really is focused on the sort of lead up to the f the Civil War. Um, and as Prue said, um, Corfe Castle, the siege, uh, the Banks family. The Banks family then go into the second book, which is a nation beheaded. Um, which is about to be published and uh, obviously relates to um, the King Charles uh, and his beheading. And then the final book is um, A Nation um, Protected, which goes into the same characters. The Banks family continue, plus some fictional characters 
into a world of um, protection by Oliver Cromwell. Um, so it does, it does take us through various, various um, stages uh, following the characters. But I just want to start with an apology, really, because I'm going to talk about the English Civil War. Um, uh, hold on, can I get this? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, well, there wasn't one. There wasn't a English Civil War. In fact, there were three wars. Uh, the first English Civil War was 1642 to 46, um, then there was another one from 48 to 49, and the final one, 51 to 52. Um, so uh, there wasn't, yeah, just one war. Uh, I also, it wasn't just about the English. Um, it was very much involved the Scottish. Um, the Irish were very much a backdrop as well. The Welsh were very much involved. Um, but even went further afield than that. So even in the Caribbean and in India, conflicts emerged at this time, all related to what was going on in, 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 in England. And finally, it certainly was not civil uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, <clears throat> more people died in this, um, in this conflict per capita than any other conflict in English history. Four out of ten males uh, were involved in the war, which is, tw which is more than both the Eng uh, First World War and the Second World War combined. Um, but at the same time, there was loads of other stuff going on. And what I wanted to talk about is today is a lot of the sort of social turbulence uh, and, um, and other things that were happening in society as well as the war. <laughs> so uh, a lot to get your head around. Um, uh, and obviously, the historical context, why it's important. I, um, you know, it, it seems strange talking to, obviously, a museum society about that. But um, you know, history does really matter. I uh, strongly believe in that. And um, yeah, Churchill always said, having a rear view mirror was really important to him in terms of thinking about direction and strategy. Um, and I guess history is all around us. It's part of our DNA. I found that out personally uh, very recently. Um, I also uh, love genealogy and, and tracking family trees. And I did a DNA test on, on myself and found out that actually I am 70% uh, Viking. So watch out. <laughs> Um, and even more worrying, I think, is my wife, who's French, um, found out that she's more English than me, um, which might be the reason she settled here. You know, she was always attracted to, um, to England, and uh, other than, obviously, a charming husband, um, it might be something within her that actually made her, made her come here. Um, and it's still, you know, uh, Prue said my background is in sort of management consultancy in real estate. <coughs> About 15 years ago, I was advising the states of Jersey about how to transform their services. I was reporting to a select committee of the government states, chaired by a very Thatcher-like lady. Um, and I came up with a suggestion about why don't Jersey and Guernsey collaborate together and cooperate and share services? She looked at me in disgust. She said, Mr. McLaughlin, don't you understand about the war? And I sort of scratched my head, thinking I knew, I knew a bit about you know, the, the occupation during the, during the, during the war, um, and I didn't see there was any collaboration. Um, but she said, no, not the Second World War, the Civil War. Jersey was very royalist, and absolutely the, the last place that actually lost out um, uh, and, and held out um, defending the royalist um, uh, monarchist position. And, and Guernsey was um, parliamentarian. And they're still in their DNA are talking about it today. So that's why there's no collaboration between Guernsey and Jersey, because of what I'm going to talk about 400 years ago. Anyway, um, yeah, it is part of our culture. It's part of, you know, we, we, uh, we always say we keep calm and carry on. It's in, and that's all part of our psychology. And that's all. What the, the beauty about historical fiction is I can sort of uh, imagine characters um, uh, as well as uh, you know historical fictional characters, historical characters, and try to uh, explain what they're going through during these events of history. And that's what I, I really enjoy. And, and hopefully, if you do get the opportunity to read the story of the Bankses, but many other characters, real and fictional, and their hopes and dreams and the challenges that they faced during this very turbulent, traumatic time. 
give you a bit of backdrop to the um, to to um, yeah to the lead up to the war. I could spend an hour just talking about this slide, but I won't. I'm going to go through it very quickly because it is a lot of trauma and a lot of um, yeah, the reasons for the war are very important. But I will I will cover it quickly. Um, the backdrop in Europe was a 30-year religious war, Catholics versus Protestants. Again, incredibly traumatic. Five million people lost their lives during that period of time. Um, and um, England uh, was, was not involved in any of that, apart from sending sort of mercenaries to support the, the, you know, typically the Protestant side. Um, uh, and that was a, a big backdrop. In, in England itself, yeah, the Reformation that, that Henry VIII um, started and uh, the establishment of the Protestant Church um, was, was fairly well established. Uh, but what was happening in England was the Protestant faith was becoming fragmented into lots of different uh, factions. And you know, one example is here, really. You know, you know, Baptists were emerging in that, pe that period of time, as well as Armenians who are very sort of um, traditional um, Protestant uh, uh, the, the Puritans, the Quakers, um, and, um, and the Presbyterians in Scotland. So there's a lot of fragmentation. And, and the thing that held all those together was their fear of the Catholics and Popism. You know, we're not too far off the um, gunpowder plot. Um, uh, Charles I's father, obviously, and his mother, were, um, you know, were almost lost their lives at that period of time. So there's a, a lot of paranoid, paranoia, and given what was happening in, in, in Europe, um, this is the backdrop of Charles I coming to the throne in 1625. Um, and it started a, a period of significant, yeah, a major tension between the king, Charles, and the parliament. Um, and you know, during this period of time, you know, they, one, not, one got on, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, one, 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 one battle and another, another responded. A lot of tension which gradually increased. So Charles started off by coming to the throne in 1625, <clears throat> but then many marrying Henrietta Maria, his, his, his French queen, who is also a Catholic. And that really did upset all the parliamentarian uh, uh, yeah, and many people in, in the country, um, the fact that he had married a, a Catholic. And they were very, very worried about that. So they responded in kind by, um, in uh, in 1628, with the Petition of Rights, Sir, J Sir Edward Coke, who himself actually lived at Corfe Castle at the time, was the architect of this really significant piece of law. Um, we don't have a constitution, but there are sort of three foundations to the constitutional law we do have, which are the Magna Carta, the Petition of Rights, and the, the Bill of Rights, which is about 40 years later. Um, and so when this, this, this piece of legislation a, took some power away from the king. B, uh, restricted his rights to uh, raise taxes even further. Um, and also, things like habeas corpus and uh, your, your castle, your, your home is your castle to the principles of ownership uh, were really, really established. And church bells across the nation were ringing, you know, the, the fact that this legislation had been through. So Parliament got one up on the king. The king responded. <clears throat> if you remember during the Brexit debacle that... Boris Johnson tried to probe Parliament for six or seven weeks. Well, Charles I trumped that by proroguing Parliament for 11 years. <laughs> he basically decided, I've had enough of these, these parliamentarians. I'm going to rule, uh, I'm gonna rule by, through a star chamber, which he created, and really antagonise everybody by putting his queen also on the star chamber. And then he ruled by, um, by uh, personal decree. Um, uh, um, uh, he wasn't able to do certain things. He wasn't able to raise taxes, but he could, he could actually play around and he'd manipulate existing taxes. And one of those things he did was what was called the ship tax, which was an existing tax. And again, causing a lot of um, uh, tension amongst, uh, amongst the aristocrats and the land landowners and the merchants um, by doing that. Um, uh, but he carried on. He, 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 by doing all these little manipulations, he was able to, to run the country and, and, and his court. But then he um, had a problem. Again, religion came into play. He wanted to um, uh, um, ensure the Scots took the English um, 
uh, prayer book and also um, the, the, the English bishops. And uh, as the Scots were Presbyterians, they were very much against that. And this caused a conflict, and it started into a, a, a sort of mini war, basically, uh, called the, the, the Bishop's War. But he needed an army to do that. So he had to recall Parliament to raise some more taxes. Um, Parliament, after 11 years, was not really that keen on giving him any money to do anything. Um, and so within a, you know, they started uh, really having a go at the king. And so he prorogued it again, but then he you know, more tension to A with the Scots and B with the Irish. Uh, and he you know, definitely needed to um, raise taxes. So eventually the, the Parliament was recalled again. And um, Parliament sat there and basically said, right, uh, over the 11 years, there are all these things that you have done wrong and we want to put right. They created what was called a grand remonstrance and they wanted the king to yeah, remonstrate against the things that have happened. Uh, it, this, this period of time, uh, just actually passing that list of, list of, um, of, uh, of, of issues that Parliament had with the king, took, um, yeah, was an incredibly term, term, uh, term, uh, traumatic period of time. In, in London, there were riots, people were being imprisoned, uh, loads of violence, etc., etc. But eventually, um, and Parliament was sitting, you know, during all, all through the mid, uh, you know, through the hours trying to get this through. Very, very similar to that sort of Brexit time, um, because the Parliament was divided on what should happen. Some of them really wanted, you know, to hold the king to account. Others were still quite supportive of the king. Um, but eventually, they got it through. Got this list of 220 odd uh, items to the king that they wanted to put right. The king didn't even bother reading it. Um, and so tension between the, the parliament and, and um, the king intensified. The king, it got to such an extent, moved his court to Oxford. Um, and many aristocrats and merchants followed. Um, and they became known as the leavers because they left the capital, whilst the ones that stayed were, were known as the remainers. So another parallel with Brexit, yeah? Remainers and leavers, believe it or not. Um, Ultimately, the situation got worse and worse and worse. Both sides raised armies. The, the king raised um, the, what's called the Royal Standard in Nottingham, just outside Nottingham Castle, in August of 1642. And that was effectively a declaration of war on Parliament. And the rest is what we're going to talk about, the English Civil War. So um, people had to decide. Which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be a roundhead or are you going to be a cavalier? And at the end of my talk, I'm going to ask you to choose. So think about this carefully as you go through. But people had to decide um, you know, at that time. And you know, a lot of people weren't engaged in the political discussions at all. They were just you know, doing their day-to-day -day work. They were in a, you know, agricultural way of life, farming the fields, and didn't really know what was going on. But they had to decide between the roundheads, which were the parliamentarians, they were called roundheads because a large contingent of them came from London amongst the apprentices in London. So in London, they, they had the, you know, the candlestick makers, the butchers, the bakers, and they all had their apprentices. And the apprentices typically had bowl-shaped haircuts, and hence they became the roundheads. The cavaliers uh, took their name from the cavalieros, who were the most um, feared Spanish uh, cavalry group in Europe, um, in incredibly um, um, uh, yeah, res uh, st strong um, uh, group uh, and a very strong reputation. Uh, but clearly, the name also had some association with the Spanish and, and, and um, uh, obviously a Catholic nation, and, and, and that sort of also was presented by the Roundheads um, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. Um, so. Some people were choosing on polit political reasons. Um, you know, they, they, they basically did actually either believe that Parliament or the King were, were better. Many others uh, were, were thinking more around religious. Um, pr pretty much the, most of the Puritans backed the Roundheads and the parliamentary cause. The Catholics who were still around in, in the country uh, were, were typically on the royalist side. Um, but there was also a big social movement. 
One of the biggest movements at the time, which was way, way ahead of its time, was called the Leveners. Um, they were really a, a movement that started in London. A guy called John Freeborn um, Labour was the, the sort of orator and leader of it. Um, and they were looking for greater uh, democracy, every, you know, everybody having a vote, uh, greater land ownership um, across the nation. And this, this sort of movement got a uh, you know, leveling up society, something we're familiar again today, yeah, leveling up. Well, the levelers were doing it 400 years ago, and, and I guess we still haven't quite got there. Um, but they were really, really uh, um, believed that the parliamentary um, uh, force would be supporting their cause, and a lot of these levelers uh, and a lot of the doctrine around, um, uh, around that uh, was embedded in the, in, amongst the roundheads. Others were much more bonded by their lords. So the Banks family were big landowners. Um, uh, there were plenty of other big landowners around. St. Barb was, uh, was, an, uh, was a big landowner as well. Around, uh, and, and, their, and, and, and many of their estate workers would follow their, their, their lord's direction, whichever way it went. Um, and then finally, people just joined you know, a force either side just to earn money, you know, paying rations, really. Um, it, was a, it was a living. Um, so you had these two sides. The conflict got to such an extent, uh, you know, uh, with, 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 um, with battles and wars impacting people's livelihoods and, and over people's land, that a whole other movement appeared, which was called the Clubman. The clubmen were so fed up of, being, um, about, of all these conflicts that they, they basically tried to protect their land against either side. And they were particularly strong in Dorset, Wiltshire, and the Midlands because it was that sort of central part of, of um, England that was really, you know, one, one minute it was the roundheads coming over, the next minute it was the, um, the, the Cavaliers. Um, so you have another choice. You can be a clubman at the end as well. So that's something you might want to think about. They were typically, I mean, as the name said, they weren't. You know, they were. They had a few um, clubs and you know forks, and you know they weren't really <laughs> a force to be reckoned with, unfortunately, uh, and um, and, and um, didn't do too well against any of the really well-trained um, uh, forces. So, um, so this is the, the sort of picture of the. Of the uh, of the, of, the, of the war as it evolved. It started, um, as I said, um, uh, Nottingham, the standard was raised. The first battle was Edge Hill near Birmingham, uh, where the two sides, two big forces came together, about 15, 20,000 soldiers each. Uh, the expectation was to be a big battle, one of them would win, and then they'd all go home. Well, that didn't happen. It was basically a stalemate. Um, and um, um, and, and then what you saw as, as that happened, you saw towns and cities and um, villages all across the country um, emerging on one side or the other and arming, um, ar arming their people. Uh, and you saw brothers fighting brothers. You saw families, you know, sons fighting fathers and friends fighting friends as they sort of split, um, depending on which one they were following. And over a period of time, you can see how the green is basically the parliamentarians, which is London being their heart, their sort of hub, and then the royalist forces being the purple. Uh, and it changes over time. You know, in the first year, the, the, the royalists do pretty well. Um, they, they come over. Uh, um, um, although, you know, these maps are just one-off spotlights. Uh, uh, you know, it's a much, much more dynamic here than this. Um, and there were lots of little sort of, for example, Arundel Castle was a royalist um, um, stronghold. Uh, Winchester started off as a royalist stronghold. Winchester itself changed hands four times, you know, royalist, parliamentary, royalist, parliamentary again. Um, um, you know, there were lots of little sort of, um, uh, you know, places um, uh, around that, um, you know, are not reflected in this map. Um, but, uh, you know, as, the, as the, the royalists did well in the first year, the parliamentarians came back and... Um, um, you know, you saw some big battles in, you know, around you know, uh, Cheriton and various other places I'm going to talk a bit about later. Um, uh, Marston Moor was uh, the first battle where a, a, a Colonel, um, Colonel Cromwell emerged uh, with his cavalry and, and it was seen as a turning point in, in the war. But the final real big conflict was Naseby. 
Um, and, and that was when um, the king, um, well, uh, the royalist forces were really, you know, thrashed and uh, the, the king escaped. He actually went to Scotland, but then got sent back again. Uh, so that's the sort of big picture, but it, um, you know, it's, it's very much more dynamic than that, that actually does, um, does portray. Just talk about some of the protagonists in the conflict. So obviously King Charles is one of them. <coughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of views on King Charles, whether he's bad or sad. Um, you know, he started off life, um, uh, he never expected to be king. He was born in 1600. Um, to James I of um, England and VI of Scotland, and Anne, his, um, his queen, who was a, a Danish uh, queen. So she was, Charles I was also half Viking as well. So, <laughs> uh, so I sort of relate to him on that ground. But it, um, um, unfortunately, he was a sickly child. Um, his, his, his parents became king and queen of, Scot uh, king, king and queen of England. Uh, left Scotland to move to England. They left Charles up there because they were, he was so sickly, they didn't think he'd make the journey to London. So he was left up, you know, without, um, without parents. Um, and um, he also had, you know, quite a lot of ailments. He had um, uh, braces around his legs. He, he had a, a speech problem, speech impediment. And then he developed a stammer. Uh, he was fairly small. He was only five foot four when he was... Um, when he reached adulthood, um, you know, at the end of his reign, he was even significantly shorter than that. Um, but, um, but, um, yeah, he never, he, 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 nobody expected him to be king, and it didn't really matter because he had an elder brother, Henry, who was exactly the opposite. You know, he was a great huntsman, a great horseman, a great, um, a great, um, uh, yeah, army officer as well. Um, and at the age of, um, but at the age of 18, unfortunately, he, he, he died, and therefore we, you know, uh, it was left for Charles to, um, 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 to, be, uh, to be the king. He passionately believed in the divine right to rule, um, uh, which basically, the, you know, uh, as a king, I'm anointed by God, and I sit beside God in governing this country, and nobody can tell me anything different. That's where he's coming from. It's something his, his father did believe in. Uh, and um, other than that, his father didn't give him any help to be a king at all, really. Um, um, he, indeed, his parents were, you know, had lots of issues going on between them. Uh, lots of funny stories I could tell, tell you about. Um, is, um, the, the, the queen one day just decided to uh, <laughs> shoot the, um, the, the King James's uh, dog, favourite dog, um, uh, for no reason at all. Uh, and, uh, and other times she went on a hunger strike. There's all this sort of tension going on. And, um, and, and, and James first also, um, yeah, just didn't give any, uh, any support to Charles. So he didn't have much, much chance, really. But as he became king, he was, became very obstinate. He wouldn't listen to advice. He was very dogmatic and, and, um, uh, and as I said, believed in this sort of um, divine right to rule. But on the, you know, he did over. He avoided a lot of the conflict until you get to the civil war of, of Europe, and you know, uh, it was a period of prosperity for England, uh, and he must have some credit for that, um, and and had a, and a fairly long reign. And some of the things he did, um, you know, just as an example, Wimborne Minster, uh, he um, uh, he uh, created a new charter and that had a sort of theological college attached to it, which enabled it to sustain. And, and if you go into Wimborne Minster, you see his um, coat of arms still there today. Um, I believe there was a coat of arms at, at St. Thomas's as well, but um, it's, been, it's been changed since. Um, and I suspect he did something similar to, to St. Thomas's. Um, uh, Covent Garden. We're all familiar with Covent Garden. Uh, he, it was his vision for Covent Garden. Uh, Indigo Jones was the architect, but it was Charles I that made all that happen. And then you see the, yeah, um, the Queen's House in Greenwich, which is this fantastic building with this tulip staircase, which is, you know, you must go and see if you haven't seen it. Again, his, his vision, his, art, his, his passion in, in terms of architecture uh, created that. So there's, there's lots of King Charles things around, uh, and, and we should give him some credit for that. Um, on the other side, Oliver Cromwell, uh, same age as the King, uh, well, born... Um, 
uh, in uh, just one year before 1659. Um, but um, frankly, he did nothing for the first 40 years of his life. Literally nothing. He, he, was, he, was, he started off in a fairly wealthy um, family. Uh, lost, they lost their, their wealth. Um, he became very depressed, very melancholic, uh, until he was about 40, when he, did, he, he found his faith. Um, he became effectively a Puritan and, uh, and believed that uh, God was using him as an instrument. Uh, and uh, this drove him all the way from, from that position to becoming a member of parliament to becoming a colonel and eventually general in the army and eventually um, uh, Lord Protector of, um, of, of this country. He was a... He was very Machiavellian in terms of his um, politics, in terms of where he manipulated uh, opponents. Um, he became the only commoner to become the uh, head of state. Uh, he did lots of good, positive things as a, um, as, a, uh, uh, as a protector. Regionalized government, reformed education, criminal justice, brought the Jews back into, into England for the first time for about 300 years. Um, and if you go to the House of the Parliament today, there's a big statue because, you know, for many people, he was considered the founder of parliamentary democracy. You get people like Margaret Thatcher and Tony Benn thinking he's, you know, one of the greatest politicians of all time, which is quite an achievement when you think about the cross-section of those two people. But at the same time, Sir Winston Churchill just thought he was a dictator. So um, a bit of a uh, Marmite character, I guess. Um, but we also see lots of rivalry in families around the, around the locality, and I'll just map some of them here. You can, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. You can see the royalists here, and as you go towards the right, they're all parliamentarians, but they become more and more radical as you go to the right, whether they were just the members of the parliament. I'm going to tell you about the, the rump parliament, which is a much smaller group of, of, um, of, of that, and then ultimately the people who actually became the regicides, the people who signed off the... Uh, the um, um, the, um, the, the warrant for the execution of, um, of Charles I. You can see John Sembrab here um, on the parliamentary side. Uh, Marquis of Winchester was one of the most... Um, uh, there's, a, there's a place near Basingstoke called Basing um, House. Um, it was the Marquis of Winchester's palace, as it were. It was the biggest sort of palace um, house outside of, um, outside of London, which did host the court, the royal court, many, many times. And there was a siege there that lasted four years. Can you imagine a siege of four years? Uh, so it was a royalist um, stronghold, and uh, the parliamentarians were sieging it on and off. But all these families divided up, and, um, um, and were, you know, lots of local rivalry amongst that. Limington itself was... Um, it was quite shielded, to be honest, from, from all this. Lymington had its salt turns and the salt works and was making money out of this war <laughs> big time. So all the, both, the army, both armies had to have salted you know, fish and meat and various other things. And, um, and the merchants of, of, um, of, of, um, of Lymington did extremely well during this period of time because they were able to um, benefit from uh, an enhanced need for salt. So back to my book and back to some of the, some of the characters. Um, Mary Banks is, um, is the sort of the heroine. And I wanted to um, you know, put, her, put her out and, and write about her because there aren't too many heroines in British history, to be honest. Um, and she certainly was. Um, she was married to Sir John Banks, who was the Attorney General and Chief Justice and spent most of his time with the King. Um, so she was left, basically, to... Um, look after the estates. They brought uh, Corfe Castle uh, and the estate um, uh, and the Kingston Lacey estate from uh, um, Sir, Sir Edward Coke in 16, 1636. Um, and she had to manage that. And she also had to mother 11 children at the same time. And then, on top of that, uh, comes the war. And she has to defend that castle. And, and she was a passionate royalist. Um, um, and... Um, uh, and, and manage all that process, and, and that's what the story's about. So, you know, the, this, the, my, my book covers 
uh, very much to the times of the, of, of the various sieges of the castle. Um, her husband, in that, in that period of time, dies, um, and ultimately the castle does get, you know, uh, does get token over, and then it, and it gets forfeited. The, the parliament takes away all her estates, so she's left with 11 children, uh, no status, uh, uh, no, no money, no revenue, uh, no estate, um, and uh, having to manage that situation, um, as well as having to find daughters, uh, sorry, sorry um, husbands for all her daughters. She had seven daughters. And you had to, you, you know, you, you, in those days, if you were, got to the age of sort of 20, 21, you were left on the shelf, basically. So it was really important for her to find husbands. And to find a husband, you had to have a dowry. Um, so she had so many challenges to deal with. And, and you know, they go from the, my first book into my second book, where she's facing all these challenges. Um, and ultimately, she builds Kingston Lacey as well. Um, so this is Corfe Castle. You can see um, this is actually the siege, uh, a, a, a painting of, which was taken at or made just after the time. This was the old castle. Um, it had really, really thick walls, 14 feet thick walls. You had, um, there were two, two attempts at the castle, uh, attempts um, that Mary Banks had to defend. The first one was just about 40... Um, men from poor parliamentarians coming to... They thought they could basically knock on the door and take it over. And in fact, it was just Mary Banks and six men behind the door. But she managed to hold off, and she sent them um, away, uh, firing a cannon at them. Uh, one of, her, one of her, the captains there managed to fire a cannon, um, which they weren't prepared for at all. But they came back a few, uh, few months later with 500 men and sieged this castle for seven months. So Mary Banks and uh, about 50 um, uh, folk, some men, well, mainly men, but some women as well, were, were besieged in this castle for seven months. Uh, you know, there were lots of bombardment from the, from the cannons, but yeah, it was pretty impregnable, this, this, the, these walls. So it didn't do too much damage. They had their own water supply. They'd, they'd stored up lots of food supplies. And they managed to last out. And I, I suspect they would have lasted out, apart from there was a betrayal. Uh, I won't tell you more about that, because you might want to read that in the story. But uh, effectively, um, um, uh, the parliamentarians won, not by force, but by, um, by deceit, I guess. Um, so we, we saw you know, that, that castle. We see lots of other castles and houses around... Um, around uh, England and um, uh, they were slighted in, in the same way as Corfe Castle, because we know it's a ruin now. It was not a ruin because of the battle at all. It was a ruin because after, after the war, um, uh, Parliament just declared that it should be slighted, i.e. blown up by the, um, by the uh, parliamentarians who were in control of it as a punishment for its um, holding out against the, uh, against, um, uh, for the royalist cause. And many, many other castles. In fact, a hundred castles up and down the country, or houses, were slighted by parliamentary act, i.e. they were blown up, in addition to all the other damage that was done during the war. So places like Arundel Castle, Basing House, were totally destroyed by, by cannons, and then all these other buildings were destroyed by gunpowder um, by the actual um, uh, people who had taken them over. Um, um, just to get a bit closer to home, I think there were... It, I've, I've, I've read some stories about um, St Thomas's uh, being um, a, a, place, a place where the parliamentary forces quartered their, their, their men for some period of time and caused quite a lot of damage. That was a story that happened in many, many churches as well across the... Corfe Castle, for example, the church was totally gutted. Winchester Cathedral, um, this is Winchester Cathedral uh, uh, main window as you go into the cathedral. If you look above it, um, you will realise, when you look closely, that is not a stained glass window. The reason for that is because once the, the parliamentary forces had taken over Winchester, um, and a guy called William Waller was the general um, leading that. He actually came from Winchester, funny enough. But um, um, at that time, the parliamentarians weren't being paid. The soldiers weren't being paid. And so the men in, in uh, Winchester weren't very happy. Um, 
and at the, and they went they, they so they started to riot and and uh, against against the generals really um and what they did was go into the cathedral, open up all the casks of all the kings and saints that were there, took the bones out and just threw them through the window, as well as shooting um, musket balls through the window, and totally destroyed the window. Um, and um, uh, and what, the, what, the, what the Winchester people did was collect all the shards of glass and then after the war, and it, took, it was about 10 years after the war, because it took a lot of work to do, they basically put it all together. But it's not obviously how it was. It's just bits of glass stuck together. So lots of symbols of, our, of, of the conflict around. Um, some of the other changes, I just wanted to talk about the conflict, because lots of other things were happening. I've already alluded to the fact that we had the leveler movement, which was a, a significant um, um, you know, a, a social movement at the time. Uh, and got a lot of traction across the country. Even more radical than a socialist rad um, leveller movement was called the Diggers. You know what you might ask well, what the Diggers were and, and where, where... I mean, effectively, this was the first model of communism. People came out, uh, they, they saw that the land, uh, after, just, after, just after the first conflict, uh, that, that you know, they had lots of issues, they had starved, uh, cost of living crisis, um, uh, food was difficult to get by, and then there was all this land that wasn't being farmed. So they just took possession of it and started digging it. <laughs> and where do you think this radical red hot, you know, sort of first communist movement happened? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, I don't know if uh, anybody knows, uh, uh, familiar with um, uh, Billy Bragg, uh, but he, he sang a, a song called um, A World Turned Upside Down, which is all about the digger movement. Um, um, but we also saw things like uh, well, the New Model Army, which, um, which was clearly the parliamentary and um, uh, uh, one of the reasons they won, um, because they had this new model, which was a model which was, A, they trained their troops, B, they provide, ensured they were supplied with um, the right... Uh, the right ammunition and right supplies, and thirdly, they promoted people by merit rather than status. It got rid of all the aristocratic sort of generals who weren't doing anything, uh, and colonels, um, and replaced them by people on merit. Uh, again, this is a totally radical way of thinking, and, you know, almost socialist in its... Uh, but we saw, you know, the Quakers and, and women's rights were also th things that were very much in discussion at this time way ahead of any other thinking. And you can see lots of ramifications of that uh, as that sort of went into, um, into the new world. The other thing that was happening was the information revolution. So we've, got, we've had the information revolution, the internet, all that stuff, social media. Um, <clears throat> they had the printing presses. So what you had was um, peddlers going around. Their, their, they did a round, typically. So they'd go from yeah, maybe Limington to you know, sway to Brockenhurst, that would be their sort of route, and they'd have a, be peddling their, their wares, with, you know, soaps and whatever. But they'd also have these pamphlets, and they would sell the news pamphlets to people. Um, and this became <laughs> the source of the real first fake news, <laughs> because there were different versions of the truth. There was the parliamentary version of the truth and the royalist version of the truth. And one person who's really, really good at this was Oliver Cromwell. So whatever, whatever conflict he was involved in, he was a PR um, guru. Uh, and people like John Milton were um, also writing about him. He would always write back to Parliament to say how good he fared in any of his battles, whether, they, whether he won them or not. You know, it was always, it was always a, a, a positive spin on it. And you also got media stars. So Mary Banks, when she turned away that, that first sort of um, group of 40 people who tried to take Corfe Castle, became a media star in the royalist news press. Uh, they basically you know, really made her something, something special. And certainly Cromwell himself was his sort of PR and, and sort of almost the brand. People flocked across the country to join Cromwell's forces because they they, they'd heard so much positive news about how effective general he was, or colonel at the time. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of things at that, 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 that time that um, were driving social change around, around information. 
Um, also, many modern-day parallels. Um, we've just been through the pandemic. Well, on top of all what I just talked about, there was plague going around as well. So Paul, for example, in 1646, at the end of the first conflict, was, was um, um, uh, locked down for a year because they had the plague. <laughs> so you've got all that to deal with as well. Uh, and we're very, we're, as well as things like the sieges, um, um, you know, whether it's a seven-month Corf Castle or four years at Beijing House, um, the, the war created also a debt crisis and also a cost of living crisis. As, as people went away to fight, clearly they couldn't farm the land. Uh, and therefore, and, and indeed, when they did come, you know, many of them didn't come back to farm the land. And so there was a massive labor shortage. And, and wheat prices and food prices just went through the roof. And there was a lot of starvation at the time as well. Um, and finally, um, trade issues, another parallel. Um, when I'm going to tell you the story of how we ultimately, the, Charles I lost his, lost his head, the rest of Europe was so appalled by what the English had done, I killed the monarch, they just, you know, we were the pariahs of, you know, they just didn't want to trade with us. France, Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands would not trade with the British. So that's why we had to focus on new trade markets and the new world. And that's why we have a, such a strong relationship, I guess. You know, certainly starting from that in, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the US and America. Um, so the second conflict, uh, what happened here? So as I said, King Charles uh, had, had been sent to um, escape to Scotland, but Scotland sent him back to the English. The English tried to negotiate with him, Cromwell and various other um, uh, parliamentarians tried to negotiate with him, but they couldn't really have, have much success. So they ended up locking him, locking him away in um, Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. Um, and there were a number of attempts to uh, rescue him um, and, and for him to escape. So this is actually his bedroom. And one famous one is um, they, they basically, the royalists um, managed to get a horse and position it outside his bedroom window. And then they had um, other royalists to take him to a boat which was wait, waiting to take him to the continent. Where his, where his son, Charles II, becomes Charles II, and his, his, his uh, Henrietta Maria were, were, and many of his followers. Unfortunately, he had too much chicken that night, and he got into the window, but he could, got stuck, basically. He couldn't move forward or backward, and he was just hanging there, calling out to the guards, help, help, and uh, obviously that was a failed, uh, failed attempt. Um, but he did manage to get some communication to the Scots. And, um, you know, the Scots, uh, uh, he basically did a deal with them that, uh, to enable, to say that they, he would, he'd previously been fighting them about pre Presbyterianism, now he's going to support it and promote Presbyterianism across the, whole of the, across the whole of England. And in return, the Scots invaded England um, on, on behalf of the, of the king, uh, and there were many, many uprisings. So this was the Second Civil War in 1648. Um, Cromwell and Lord Halifax, uh, Fairfax sorry, uh, basically put an end to that incursion with the Battle of Preston there. Um, but they were really now really fed up with King Charles. Um, he'd actually asked, in their view, they were English, really. Uh, he was the King of Scotland and England, but in, in their view, as an Englishman, he'd had... A foreign force, the Scots, invade England um, to try and um, uh, uh, you know, to try and for, uh, protect his position, um, and um, you know that was the final straw. So um, what happened was Parliament was still divided. There were still many people in Parliament. I mean, there were various factions in Parliament, ranging from those who still actually supported the king, to people who thought the king should be punished but, but should stay king, to people who actually thought he should be tried and executed. Um, to ensure, and, and they were debating all what should happen, basically the parliament was purged by uh, a colonel called uh, Pride, um, which meant that there were about 400 parliamentarians. They turned up one day to parliament. There were, you know, there's basically um, soldiers all the, way, all the way around. Uh, a number of the parliamentarians on the list were arrested. 
the rest and, and uh, many more were barred from entering Parliament um, until they got to a situation where there were about just half the number which became known as the Rump Parliament. And the Rump Parliament sat and were then able to agree a, a charge for the king uh, and setting up a trial for the king. The, 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 the charge would be treason, which was a difficult one, really, because the definition of treason is, um, you know, is, a, is a crime against the king. Uh, <laughs> and how can the king be you know, uh, committing a crime against himself? They, what they did extended the definition of king to king and commonwealth, which is basically the people, and, by the, by, and argued that the king had raised the standard against the people and also invited the Scots um, in, in the Second War. So, cut, cut a long story short, that, 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 that bill was passed in terms of the setting up the basis for the trial, and uh, Charles was taken from Carisbrook. He stayed some time, a couple of weeks, at Hearst Castle. Um, my second book talks a lot about this time at Hearst Castle and Lymington. Um, but then he goes from Hearst Castle to Winchester, from Winchester to Windsor, uh, and Windsor, he is faced with a trial. And there is King Charles in Westminster Hall. Westminster Hall is where our queen was laid to rest. Um, sorry, not laid to rest, uh, laid in state, sorry, uh, um, if you remember. Um, it's a, it's a, a really big old hall built by King Rufus, um, and it was the place for his trial um, because many, many people wanted to witness it. There were 68 judges, uh, mainly from that rump parliament. Um, um, uh, most of them had already uh, determined what the outcome of the trial was. Uh, the, this was the president, John Bradshaw, who was an unknown person, really. Um, and the king here, you know, looking at a very solitary figure, uh, A, he didn't recognize the, recognize the court, and B, he never um, uh, uh, submitted a plea, um, whether, you know, because uh, he didn't recognize the court, so he couldn't recognize the charges, and therefore he ne never had the opportunity to defend himself at all. Um, but that didn't deter the, the judges to make up the decision uh, that he was guilty, 59 of the 68 signed his death warrant and became regicides. Uh, the king then was faced with the prospect of, um, at the end of uh, January 1649, um, this building here is uh, what's called the, the Banqueting Hall. It's a fantastic building. And it's ironic, really, because, again, the king uh, started by James I, but King Charles finished it, Indigo Jones being the architect. The ceiling, uh, Van Dyke ceiling, um, pictures his father, James I, on the right-hand side of God. Um, that's how he, you know, this, is, this was the image of the divine right to rule. And Charles was in this palace, in this banqueting hall, and had to step through one of those windows onto the, uh, the scaffolding outside, so that's the banqueting hall, step outside there, and uh, that was the end of, uh, of our monarch. Um, on a freezing, freezing cold day. Many people in the, in the crowd were, were you know, roundhead parliamentarian soldiers who'd come to see justice being done. They'd, they'd lost their brothers and their fathers and their sons uh, and, uh, and wanted to, and, and didn't really understand the reason for the war and wanted to see justice. But there were many people here, you know, you can see, uh, you know, somebody's obviously upset there, somebody's fainted there. Um, and if you know, uh, Whitehall at all, uh, and you, you know, the entrance to Horse Guard Parade is here where the two sort of um, um, Coldstream guards sit on the, on the horses. Uh, above there's a clock tower, and at two o'clock there's a black mark, which is the time that King Charles was executed. And people still come every year to com commemorate, commemorate maybe the wrong word, but um, to um, remember the, uh, yeah, um, 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 the death of uh, the only time a, a king has been executed, and, and, and they see, you know, basically see the King Charles as, as effectively a martyr, I guess. Um, but that wasn't the end of the story because we've got a third war still. <laughs> so, about two or three days later, after the king was executed, the Scots um, uh, identified Charles, well, made Charles, his, Charles's son, Charles II. 
um, King of Scotland. And um, it, took, it took a little bit, a bit of time for him to negotiate how he's going to do this. But effectively, he, he was on the continent at the time. He, he landed in, in Scotland and, 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 and basically got another Scottish force to, ready to invade England. Uh, and therefore, uh, with, the, with, the, with the aim of um, re-establishing his right to the throne, uh, which the Scots were backing. Unfortunately, Cromwell um, had better, uh, better ideas of that and actually invaded proactively Scotland. Um, and the, his, his most famous victory of all time was the Battle of Dunbar um, in, on the 3rd of um, September, um, 1651. Cromwell was totally outnumbered, two to one. The, um, he was basically by the harbour. He had very poor supplies. Many of his, his troops were sick. Um, and the Scots came in, not Charles, Charles wasn't there, but the, the Scottish army surrounded him on a, on a ratio of two to one and were ready to do battle. And what they expected to, to happen was um, the next day, you know, they all get up. Um, and they all sort of form, form lines and, you know, about 11 o'clock they'd be ready to fight and uh, they'd have a big fight and the Scots would win and, and that'd be it. Uh, Cromwell always did the unexpected um, and um, he, again, he, he raised his... Um, he, he, he got an enormous amount of passion amongst his troops. He got them all up in, a, in the middle of the night. They moved positions and by dawn they were amongst the Scots fighting and killing them all, uh, singing psalms because uh, they believed that they were uh, basically um, you know, an, an instrument of God. They were fighting for God, uh, God's glory, and um, they um, caused an, a, 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 an incredible victory. Uh, hardly any of the Scots survived, and, um, and, um, the, um, uh, and it became... Um, the, st the starting point of, of, of Charles, uh, sorry, Cromwell, then going on to actually capture the rest of, you know, all, all, um, all, all of the Scottish big towns. Um, and, and effectively capture Scotland. So Julius Caesar failed to capture Scotland. William the Conqueror failed to capture Scotland. Edward I failed to capture Scotland. But Cromwell did succeed. Uh, and that's why he most probably goes down as one of the, you know, one of our greatest generals. Uh, Charles II did actually manage to uh, get the rump of the Scottish army and invade um, England. And Cromwell chased after him. And basically, the, 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 fight, the finale was at the Battle of Worcester, uh, uh, 3rd of September, the year after um, uh, of the Battle of Dunbar, precisely one year after. And the decisive battle was the end of the royalist um, campaign, which started another little story, which is the, the feature of my third book, really, a, a big a section of it, which is Charles II's escape. So Charles um, had to basically get back to continental Europe. Uh, the obvious place was going to, through to Wales, uh, but the parliamentarians along the River of Seven uh, basically had you know, lined, lined troops up along it. Um, and so he had to basically go in disguise um, and disguise himself as a sort of farm labourer, uh, well, just a labourer or a servant. Um, and it's quite difficult because Charles II was actually six at four um, and, you know, really stood out, yeah? And clearly he was also a nice bended complexion and spoke, you know, in a... Di so he had to... He, he, he basically put walnut oil on his face to darken his face he learned the local dialect and, and taught and spoke like a, you know, a, a local labourer. Um, and even the way he walked and the way he hung um, and, and clearly the way he dressed. Uh, and he basically, and he had, uh, um, he had to get from all the way from Preston and eventually got out on the south coast. Uh, there were so many moments, that's why it's an interesting story, where he almost got caught. Because he was basically him and maybe one other. He couldn't go abandon them because they would be too obvious. So just him and some other, you know, either, either he was a servant to um, uh, um, a noble or, or a just, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, with some other, some other laborers um, disguised. He had shoes that didn't fit. He had blisters. I mean, it was, you know, really, really. And he had to do a 600-mile walk. <laughs> um, 
And you know, as an example, um, at one time he was in a kit, um, he went, he was, he was pretending to be a servant of a, of a lady. Uh, the lady stayed at a friend's house, and she was obviously, you know, um, uh, treated accordingly. But as a, as a servant, he had to go in the kitchens. The, the cook asked him to put the meat on meat on the spit and turn the spit. He didn't know how to do that. And he said, so, so who, who are you? What, what, why can't you even know how to turn a spit? And he quick-wittedly said, I'm from such a poor background, we never had meat. <laughs> but if he had got caught, he'd just done the same as Charles I, yeah? He basically sent a Scottish army into, into England. He would have had to have been executed um, by, by the parliamentarian forces. And so would the, you know... Moment, would the monarchy have survived? Because obviously it did become Charles II, and the monarchy did survive um, through succession. But the, the, you know he didn't have any. Um, uh, uh, his brother J James, uh, who was a Catholic, uh, succeeded him. There was no way uh, um, at any point in time that, that James would have been invited to be king. So um, you know, big question mark there. Lots of little things in history just. <laughs> turn on, on events. Um, so we end up with, you know, 1649 was a, a time when, when Charles I ruled and governed the country. Um, you know, he governed. Uh, the, 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 the parliament were just there to endorse various, you know, foreign policy, taxes, various other things. But he was actually, in, you know, a, a governing the country. Uh, he was also a defender of the faith. The outcome of the war was really the precedent that the monarch could not govern without parliamentary consent. And that's what um, Cromwell understood and took and established, and it became to what we have today, where the head of state does not rule. Um, he appoints um, you know, politicians, uh, prime ministers and ministers, and opens parliamentary sessions, but has actually no real power. Although he does provide that sort of national identity and and stability and continuity, which we, 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 we obviously recognize with the passing of um, our, our queen. Um, and you know, Charles III now is in, in, in that position and, and is becoming defender of the face as, as well as defender of the face. So um, you can see how things evolved. Um, so I asked you at the beginning, who amongst you would be a parliamentarian then? Okay. Royalists? Yeah, they, my research says that Lymington was slightly more royalist, uh, even though it was, um, there was definitely a parliamentary garrison here, and the parliamentary garrison went away and actually um, destroyed Christchurch um, um, Castle. But I think overall there were a few more um, royalists here. Any clubmen amongst you? <laughs> <laughs> Or any diggers, even. <laughs> One digger in a back. OK. It's, it, it's not black and white, is it? Because, I mean, you know, you, I, I, I personally change my view quite often. Um, you know, I'm, clearly I've got some of the Danish Viking links to Charles. Um, um, you can see the power and the strength of the monarchy. But, it, you know, if you've got the wrong person doing it, there was, I think there were so many opportunities for that conflict not to happen. If, if Charles wasn't so obstinate and Parliament, and Parliament hadn't been, you know, treated so badly for 11 years, if they, if they, if they reconciled that. But um, we ended up where we are, and, um, and it's, a, you know, the people who had to do the fighting, the people who had resulted in the, you know, the, uh, the you know, the uh, uh, not losing people, losing family members, and then putting up with the consequences of, no food, high, high, high inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, you know, they didn't have a real say in this. Um, but anyway, I, I wrote this book, and I, as I said, I'm interested in genealogy. And um, after publishing the book, I, I followed another route of my tree uh, my, on my, my mother's side and found out that um, I'm, this is my, my family tree, and they were actually in Corth Castle, which is really weird. I have a character in my book called Josh Miller. I was going to call him John Miller, but I had too many Johns, and I, and I, I, I at the last minute, changed it to Josh. And um, 
you know, I actually have a relative called John Miller in, in Corfe Castle, which is really, really weird. It's a bit spooky. I think I'm sort of destined to, to tell the story in many ways. Um, uh, but uh, finally, just to wrap up, there are two types of uh, writers, those who are insane and those who are um, good at hiding it. So I've hopefully I've hidden it well today. And um, any, any, we're very welcome to um, take any questions about, uh, about the book, about Corfe, about the banks, about local, local politics, local, um, local uh, people and places. Thank you so much, Neil. That was uh, fascinating. And having read the book, I think you swing between royalist and uh, <laughs> parliamentarian. Uh, you, you're very sympathetic to Margaret, <laughs> to uh, Lady Banks. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think yeah, that's where you get the people. There, there's good people on both sides, obviously, um, and it's not black and white. Yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> Sorry? How much is the book? <laughs> okay. Um, well, tonight's special offer is eleven pound fifty. It's twelve ninety nine in in in, um, in bookshops. Well worth a read. I enjoyed it. No. Yes, Lots sir. of history. Yes. Did you start with a really clear idea of everything, or did you start with a sketch, or did you start with nothing and it just evolved? Um. Very much ev evolution, and um, and the second book and, and the third book as well. The, you, you, you start to. I mean, clearly there are some f historical f uh, historical characters. You, you know, like Mary Banks. I, I, I had, to, but I didn't know too much about her, and I had to research her and find out, you know, what, you know her, her her history. Uh, uh, you know, what, what all her children were doing, and various other things that that take you in different directions. So, you know, one of her. Uh, uh, a daughter's married, you know, a, a, a parliamentarian, um, and I had to, you know, find out about, you know, and, and took me in that direction. And um, I, th I think, I think the National Trust think I'm trying to tweak my stories because it seems like all their their <laughs> premises are, are, are part of my my stories I go through. So, Court Castle, Kingston Lacey, um, Mottisfort um, is very um, in Romsey is a, a significant part of my. Um, uh, my second book, um, and, and the Sandies there, uh, as well as the, the Vine in, um, in, uh, in um, Basingstoke, which was also owned by the Sandies, but actually got, um, they got taken away by Parliament and um, acquired by uh, a parliamentarian. Um, I, I, uh, um, Clevedon as well. Um, um, I, 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 my characters were going into, uh, ended up, I can't tell you too much about this in, in the second book, but uh, a, rela a relationship fostered, which is true, between um, Lord Fairfax's daughter and um, a, a very, very significant royalist, the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of followed through from characters I was building. I end up in this Clevedon now, because <laughs> that's where they were, uh, and, and Duke of Buckingham. Owned. So, yeah, I mean, it does... It does I, I, you know, I start with some idea, but I end up... Uh, by research and events going in totally different directions, which is quite hard to deal with, really. <laughs> Any other questions? It's your time. Thank you so much. Very, very uh, interesting, and um, yes, we look forward to number two. <laughs> Don't forget, the next talk is piracy. The history of piracy, and he takes us through a few sunken vessels. So I'll leave it at that. And um, don't forget to see the open before it closes. And have a nice weekend. Looks as though it's going to be glorious. Thank you.